Sorry to update my little editor program, but it appears to be working now. Let me see. Okay, yep. All right, just a couple things about myths. And I always like myths. I think every, uh, so much of American history is based on myths. And so this will pop up on my playlist. And so it should be very easy to access. And just to review then on Wednesday, we'll do the quick, on Wednesday, uh, either papers or presentations. And I'll just send a quick email to each in, everybody who sent a presentation asking if you want to do a quick presentation, if you have a camera or at least voice, you can do it online and uh, eh, be nice to hear people again. And, oh, it's not working. Just give me a sec. <laughs> I forgot to change my uh, picture for this. It's, it appears to be uh, U.S. Marines on Mount Suribachi. Uh, during World War II at Iwo Jima. So, first thing about myths, and yeah, my, my great picture of Paul Bunyan. And so I've got to uh, designate what a myth is, what mystery or myths, what uh, fables, folklore, just a couple things like that. And to talk about that, I'm going to give everybody one second. Don't you like that picture? Um, so, just a couple things. First off, myths are different than fairy tales and folklore stories like that so we just want to quick talk about those really quick so fairy tales which we've had just had snow white and that's an escape to a magical world and you really see the fairy tales come from middle ages and grimm's fairy tales are dramatic fairy tales stories that come back to explain maybe not even the mysteries of the world but we have um a little bit about mysteries, about the, not really to explain the mysteries, but to escape the mysteries and have an ulterior end, ending. And so Snow White is a great one. Uh, Hansel and Gretel, you know, there's a lot of great fairy tales. And here's one, um, The Messenger of Death, where a man helps death, nurt, finds death sick on the side of the road, helps him and asks, how could you help death? And he said, okay, all I ask is one thing in return for helping death. He said that uh, when it's nearing time for me to die, please give me indication when it's time. Yet, he didn't hear anything from death for 60 years. And then all of a sudden when death came back and said, oh, you know, it's time to go. He said, wait, you were supposed to warn me. And death said, I did warn you. You got sick. <laughs> you had heart trouble. You were getting weak. That's how I warned you. And so that's the great fairy tale about that. Good story, but okay, what a, I don't know if that's a good story. I like it, though. Fables, fables are a little bit different and they blend together, but that teaches a moral lesson in Aesop's fables. And that goes back to um, 300 BC, but Aesop's fables, uh, here you can see a copy of it. And this is one from, uh, uh, what is it, 1663, but, but Aesop's fable, uh, Basically, they teach some kind of moral, a lesson. Sometimes they're magical stories. Sometimes they combine people and magical stories. A little bit like fairy tales. And here's everyone's favorite, the story of two frogs. And here you have two frogs taking on a journey. And one, it, um, one is prepared and prepped and, and organized. And the other one just went right off and without thinking. And I'm hearing noises. Just a sec. And one frog, uh, sorry, <laughs> just heard something weird. Okay, so, and the whole idea about this one is you must prepare, AKA look before you leap. Eh, a couple more good ones, you know, the, top, the, the tortoise and the hare. And that's actually from a Warner Brothers cartoon, one of the first Bugs Bunnies. And um, how overconfident the rabbit got way ahead of the tortoise in a race and took a nap and the tortoise who kept plodding and working hard uh, won. And so the idea of hard work can overcome overconfidence, etc. Here's the fox and the raven. Another great one where the fox is holding a piece of cheese because, or I'm sorry, the raven's holding a piece of cheese because of course. And the fox wants the cheese because that's what fox is like. And so he starts telling the raven, oh, you're the best raven ever. You're so amazing looking. Um, 
As you could you smile and show how just attractive you are and the, the raven smiled and dropped the cheese. Flattery. Um, sometimes flattery can be used against you. So another example, folk tales and folklore. So folk tales, these are stories uh, passed down throughout the years and they relate to life in general. Either they're stories about life, kind of just fun stories. Somebody here called tall tales about uh, you know some humans that do these great marvelous things or animals do things and that they're heroes and folklores are very similar but these are more about the beliefs and practices sometimes they're scary stories these are the ideas of you know the uh like stories my grandmother used to tell or stories that were passed down and so instead of like an individual they're more about kind of the practices or beliefs about the values of society and the United States has expanded. We get a lot of great folk tales and folklores, and they're very close to each other, a little bit different, but they have an element. Uh, there's Dan Fink, who was a great shot, one of the great marksmen, and so there's all kinds of stories about Dan Fink. Here's a real person, but would take become a folk tale in many ways. You can see by the pot on his head, Johnny Appleseed, who was a real person, but this became the story of planting apple trees for farmers and the idea about um, the pluckiness of the pioneers and creating a new life. I should add, he was a small D Democrat, a Jeffersonian Democrat who thought small farmers need to survive. How do you survive? By finding a crop that will grow well, AKA apples. Why? Apple cider. Here's one of the great folklores and there might've been a person named this, but John Henry, and either it was a former slave or a slave who with his sledgehammer and drill was the hardest working and, and fastest worker in history and could drill tunnels faster than the machine. And I remember being a little kid and getting a little, <laughs> a record. It was like one of those square pieces of um, square paper with inside was a round little cheap little record. Boy, I wish I still had that. But it had the story of John Henry who beat the mechanical drill and tunneled faster. And his, his last breath was finishing the end of the tunnel and finish it. And then he died. But it showed how humans, how there was a man stronger than a machine. And yes, machines are great, but men, the individual, are so powerful. And it's interesting that he's a former slave to give the idea of the complexity of time. Another one we have to get to real quick, legends. Now, legends, they're based upon Here's some facts. You see legends as being historical. I'll give you a, what King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And that's a 16th century or 15th century painting of King Arthur and the chivalry around King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table uh, with this idea that even at the time of civilization falling apart, going into the so-called dark ages of the 6th century, there were still people trying to preserve this element of civilization. And what that means is we always have that in our history. Sure, it might be dark times now, but mankind, I'm saying mankind because these are men, but men have always found a way to bring back civilization. It's in us. It is in us. And you add an element of mysticism and folklore in that. Another one, of course, is Robin Hood. Robin Hood, uh, former nobleman who was banished, began robbing, stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. And virtually every society, especially as they became more monetary and the issues of debt, that's a whole nother story. Um, that should be a myth I should do is just on money. But I've already talked about that a little bit. But about Robin Hood, uh, you know, taking from the rich and giving to the poor with this idea that humans, regardless of how greedy they seem, there is an element of purity we have, altruism that we will give back to others, that we truly do care about others, which, of course, it's part of the reason why this legend also becomes a myth with this idea being that, you know, despite the fact of how greedy people are and how they accumulate wealth and a lot of times don't seem to care, Sure, but maybe we will someday. Someday we'll do it. Not now, but someday we'll care about others. But for example, Koba would be the Robin Hood of, the, of Russia. And the story is about Koba 
would um, steal from the very wealthy and give to the poor serfs, and how this would become a legendary figure who would lead to the myth that people really can redistribute wealth of the, the heads of the Socialist Party. And there's this guy, uh, a revolutionary, Joseph um, Jules Vili, who would uh, take that name Koba and then eventually Koba Stalin. You might have heard of him. And so this myth could also be used as a way of trying to say that, yes, I am really good. I'm like Robin Hood. Trust me. But that's a legend. And so let's get to then myths. We always have myths, but myths are used to explain, uh, to explain how something happened, how we got here, to justify it, you know, to, to, to give some kind of glory, to give a bigger meaning, like there's some greater purpose why we're here, to give us something to believe about ourselves. The big thing about myths is, yeah, there's all kinds of myths and some things we just, you know, are, are kind of harmless myths or relatively harmless myths, you might think. But all of it stem to give you an ideology, an ideology of where you came from. And Paul Bunyan is a great example of this because it, kind of, it lays out a little bit of a little bit of folklore, of folk tales, of a legend. But it's also this myth that would develop. This idea of the plucky, hard-working frontiersman. This is me being a hard-working frontiersman. You can see me in the background walking. They built the West on their own. They did it. Their hands. They made it. No one did it for it. This idea that the individual alone did it. And Paul Bunyan fits in that myth. And this whole, it started as a folktale, but would become this idea that there's a myth that Paul Bunyan, as we know it, is this folktale about plucky individualism, the kind of America we want, and that is the myth, that we could do it on our own. And the, the big thing about that is, if we could do it on our own, then if you fail, that's your own fault. And so that really lays out the ideology. And almost every other culture that I've read about, I, I could find something like this. You'll see the same thing with the, I was thinking about the Germanic tribes because I always find that so fascinating. They went back and, and had these stories about these, nor, uh, look at it, these uh, Germanic gods who were bigger than life, who did it by themselves and we are descended from them just as we are descended from great people or from these plucky, hardworking guys like Paul Bunyan. I should add this Germanic myth would lead directly to the idea of Arianism and German culture and i think you can probably see where that's going but this ideology then myths will set up this belief about ourselves, and the myths become much bigger than uh than reality we go back to so many but this gives us the image of what we believe i should add by definition then myths have a kind of a uh be socially a, a conservative tinge they go back not to the way things really were, but to the way things should have been, the way we would have liked them to be. So with that, Paul Bunyan. So Paul Bunyan started this myth of his frontiersmen. There was a myth about this. You see a couple people talk about this. This lumberjack who could cut, um, was a massive man who one blow of his ax cut down a tree, who could carry it himself, and soon there developed this, he had this sidekick who turned into an ox because why not? And the, his big blue ox would eventually become Babe's blue, Babe the blue ox. And they, in their own way, conquered the West. And that's the idea of the pristine, but there's all kinds of stuff that come out of that. But this was a myth. Oh, there are, oh, I'm sorry, not a myth. This was a folklore, a folk tale. You know, like Pecos Bill, the great cowboy, who, of course, never wore cowboy hats, because that's a myth, but that's another story. They, this, this um, folklore about this kind of animal and hero came alive, but it turned into something different where people got to know was because it was an advertising campaign for the Red River Lumber Company. This is in 1917 they first started doing this. The Red River uh, Company hired well actually um 
It's, it's William Lagerall. He is named, he, uh, he had done a, a number of little stories. He was an artist. These great little pictures he would draw. And he came up with this idea as an advertisement for the Red River Company. And so these great pictures of Paul Bunyan here sawing down three trees at once. And here's even the um, advertising train for the Red River Lumber Company for Paul Bunyan. Eventually they would have Paul Bunyan and the Great Blue Ox. And eventually you would come with, uh, you know, Paul Bunyan, uh, the Blue Ox would dig the, um, the Grand Canyon or um, I'm sorry, Paul Bunyan would do the Grand Canyon by with his plow, digging it up. This whole myth about Paul Bunyan would develop as the myth is, we believe it was a folktale. When in reality, it all came from advertising. Everything we know about it was this advertising campaign, taking a myth or a folk legend, <laughs> a folk tale, and turning it into something totally different and then selling it as a folktale. That's the myth. And that's the idea that we are willing to believe certain parts of our country and believe it because it fits into what we believe, especially when it's sold to us, like they would sell literally paper, towels, and paper because that's what they sold. So that's one. Oop, wrong picture. Here's another myth. And I just stuck this in there because we had this. So the idea about Disney and he was kind of unknown and all these stories came about, about these rich people who had all these, uh, access to various sciences and you know disney especially by the 1960s was <laughs> all kinds of stories came out about disney and into the 70s so one you've heard about that people mention this to me he was cryogenically frozen and his head is in well okay this is not his head somebody made this please do not think i showed you a picture of his head and there's other people who have supposedly had their head frozen and so when they could reanimate life down the road, let's say 2021, and they could bring his head back and I guess clone or make another body or put his head in a jar. I don't know what, but somehow he'd be able to come back. No, no, his head is not frozen. In fact, he was cremated. He is not, he, um, it just shows you how once people start believing this, this idea that this kind of wealthy cabal of rich people who can do whatever they want. And here's the thing about a myth. You notice what happens. There kind of is that. There, there, there kind of is. But by saying it in a way that, hey, Tatus froze his head and, and they do all these weird things and um, they don't really, or uh, things are outside the norm and very extravagant, even the pictures on the yacht, you know, just look at them. It, the myth is these wealthy people are just kind of just kind of do all these fun things and it hides. It allows them to go under the radar when they're the things like controlling your economy, etc. So no, he did not cry out, genetically froze his brain. That is an extraordinarily creepy picture. But I guess if I wanted my head frozen, I would want it in just some random freezer they could open up in there. I could be looking at them. Next, George Washington. Let's go through a couple of the myths about George Washington. Because the thing about George Washington, why this is such a big deal, is this idea that he was the first president, the founder of the country. And this sets up this hero worship. We'll see it again with Columbus, and I haven't decided how I want to do Columbus, but this idea of this greater than life figure, that um, this elite figure that almost through their, their own individual greatness created the country. And that really has a couple different things about it. First off, it's myth about the United States comes from purely noble, great ideals, and it fits in with the growth of nationalism in the early 19th century. But there's something else. What does it say about regular people when it took somebody who is beyond normal, like the myth of George Washington and who he is? What does that say about regular people? It says that your regular can't do it. So this fits in the idea that only that there are only a few people that could run the country, create things. And this ties into, it, you might not even realize it, but our style of government. We don't have all the people decide, we have just a few. And this fits in with the, the great man theory. Because if the great man can do it, 
If only the great man could do it, you can. I'm pointing at you. So, Parson Weems, Weems was, he was a parson. <laughs> but he would write a book. He took some stories about George Washington, but wrote a biography. The Life of George Washington with Curious Anecdotes. All anecdote means is a story. And this was done after he died. And so this was his 1810, but the uh, first one was three years before. And he'd even have someone from the, uh, somebody supposedly served with Washington who said, this is all completely true. Well, this is just made up. He just came up with almost all these stories and some of you might've heard of, but think about the great man myth. If it's the great man who can do it, you can't. So obey the great man. Obey. So let's get to a few of them. Number one, there's Parson Weems. And this very creepy picture is him looking out the window saying, see, there's the story as I tell it. I think that picture is great. But and then also, look at George Washington in this picture. He's supposed to be a little boy. He's supposed to be a little boy. <laughs> Look at that face. Can they get anything creeper? Creeper, it reminds me of one of those medieval paintings when they show, when they're trying to show, uh, it's uh, in Christian medieval Europe, and it's supposed to be Mary and Jesus, and as Jesus as a young boy, and they have him with an adult face. It is that creepy. But, supposedly, George Washington was caught and George Washington, I mean, gee, did he age prematurely? But he was caught by his father, Augustine. He chopped down a cherry tree. And he said, son, did you chop this tree down as, as Washington holding an ax? I guess, but with great honesty said, I cannot tell a lie. I chopped down this tree. And that shows that yes. Oh, and then Augustine said, you did the right thing. Yes, you should not have shot down the cherry tree, but since you were so honest, that shows you have great character and you can take this story whatever way you want it. But here is a man like George Washington who valued honesty more than anything else. So while everybody else is on these own partial means to get rich or do whatever they want, Washington, creepy as he looked, he valued honesty and that is the roots of our country. And no, we can't ever meet that. And yes, you might argue, wait, that's the goal we want to reach. Yes, that is the goal. But we are just mere mortals. It takes somebody special and greater than us to lead. By the way, no, there's no evidence of that. This is purely just made up. It's a great story, as in great imagination. Another one. Here's a great story of a visiting Betsy Ross to approve the 13 star fly with the the stars in the blue field in a circle. And Betsy Ross, who was in Philadelphia, who made the flag, and Washington visited her and approved the flag of the United States, the flag that if we were in my classroom, I would point to it and just imagine I'm pointing to it. Actually, I'm facing you, so it'd be here. But, no, this is purely made up. It's implying that George Washington's, George Washington did everything including coming down from his army encampment north of the city to go into Philadelphia. And it's unclear when he did it because I've seen it as early as 1878 where the British still hadn't left Philadelphia, but I guess he came in as a spy because he's so desperate to see the flag. Well, let's get to a couple things. First off, no, there's no evidence that he ever met Betsy Ross. There's no evidence that he had anything to do with the flag or more, more importantly, cared. They just wanted some kind of banner to show who they were, and that's it. And this fits in with another myth I should just add right now. We have no idea Betsy Ross had anything to do with the creation with, of the flag. Almost certainly she did not. Yes, she did sell banners for the new United States, uh, for the new United States, especially after the British left in, at the end of 1878, left Philadelphia. And yeah, she probably did so, but we have no evidence. Her son came up with this 25 years after. There's no evidence. So the whole thing about Betsy Ross, almost certainly the majority made up, but Washington have anything to do with it? Made up. By the way, Betsy Ross is home, big tourist trapping by all kinds of cheap flag stuff in Philadelphia. Uh, I went there last. Uh, I didn't actually go in. I've been there um, once before a few years ago, but when I was in Philadelphia in October, 
which seems so weird to go to travel someplace. It's so weird now to travel someplace. But Philadelphia, uh, you go there, it's just all um, cheap knickknacks and things like that. But once you get past the gift shop, which appears to be 90% of the place, but actually get past that, it's a really good representation of an 18th century home. It's really actually pretty cool. But most people are buying Chotskys with, uh, with flags on it. So next, George Washington had wooden teeth. And this famous painting of George Washington, which could be anywhere, I'm just trying to guess. But <laughs> look, look, you see? See the face, see the face? See? Same guy, he didn't age a lick. Oh, sorry. Never aged. So, did he have wooden teeth? Well, yeah, he had bad teeth and suffered through this his whole life. You could imagine dental care was pretty shaky at that time. And yeah, they did brush their teeth, um, sometimes with bark, sometimes with other things, but he had bad teeth, he had to have them pulled out. And so, the story was he had wooden teeth. And the idea about this is, it's a couple of different things. But wooden teeth was seen as he was more of a commoner, a regular person, not putting on airs. George Washington was one of us. Yes, a great man, but number one, he's a citizen, just like all of us. Well, no. First off, part of the reason he's in that is because you have to pose and nobody smile, but his mouth did bug him. He was embarrassed about it, didn't like to talk. And you can imagine if you have a contraption made out of uh, steel and leather to hold teeth into your mouth, it's gonna be really hard to talk. You'll that, that, slur a lot. I mean, people with, with dentures, it's an issue. But he was the wealthiest, at least by land and slaves, man in the United States. He was the elite. His whole goal in life was to be the elite. All he wanted to do was be rich, be famous, and be an officer in the British Army. <laughs> That's all he wanted as a little kid. So the idea that he had wooden teeth is crazy. First off, nobody had wooden teeth. Wood warps. Wood has splinters. Think about it. What did he have? Well, those are his actual teeth. And that it's iron. Can you imagine that? An iron, um, iron dentures? Oh, that had to hurt his gums so bad. But they would use human teeth, yes, sometimes teeth of slaves, animals' teeth polished, sometimes ivory, and he probably did have some ivory teeth, and that would be more for show if you want to smile. But no, he did not have those. Wooden teeth, once again, this myth about who he was is not the reality. Here's another one. And the Nelton Prayer at Valley Forge, that is Parson Weems who was Episcopalian and technically uh, Washington was an Episcopalian, technically. But he's trying to put, uh, Weems is trying to use this as a way of saying, see, they were religious, our founding fathers, and therefore we should continue this tradition of the United States. And we're just about at the time as a country before the Second Great Awakening, the Industrial Revolution, and this revival of a new kind of religious feeling that was literally just starting, this very evangelical feeling that started with the Industrial Revolution in Britain. So it fit in that, but no, there's no evidence that he knelt in prayer to ask for guidance against the British at Valley Forge, the dark days of the winter of 1770, get my years right, 1777, 1778. They had just lost at Brandy, uh, Brandywine in Germantown. Philadelphia had been taken. The Continental Congress was on the run. It looked like it could be over. And the idea was is that he was looking for divine guidance. No, he, no, no one ever saw him pray. Uh, pray. He never, he, he went to church because everyone did. But he was by no means what, what today people would consider religious. And then he was constantly attacked for not being religious. He would never say God. He always said the creator. And some of you probably know where this is going. He was a deist. And he did not believe in an interactive God. He believed that there was a creator who started everything. And then people have the ability to choose their own fate. 
That was George Washington. And you see this all the way today. The big myth about that is, it's people want to say that the founding fathers were very religious because they have reasons today to make the founding fathers look religious. That they want people to believe this about the, the United States was started as a Christian country, or it wasn't, or some other religion, the banger point of view. And just the same as someone today could say that, well, the founding fathers weren't religious, so you shouldn't be religious. It's much more complex than that. People are different and you have to decide on your own, but people try to use this as a way to manipulate you now. Myths are used of the past to get you to believe something to, to believe something today. Here's another one. And this is one that I just had this, um, I've had people tell me this, I've had people I've worked with tell me this, that he was the first one to live in the White House. And there's a picture of the White House in 1800 and George Washington lived in it. Well, first off, no one called it the White House until after it was rebuilt after the War of 1812. And actually, that's a picture of the first uh, presidential mansion in New York City. No, there was no Washington, D.C. The first president to move in there was Adams. Washington didn't do this. It was Adams was the first president in 1800. And he was in both Philadelphia and New York. Washington was and spent a lot of time back home. The Capitol, the actual Washington, D.C., was literally built near a swamp. Okay, they ended up building it on the Maryland side of the Potomac, but they carved out a piece of Maryland and Virginia as a political measure. Washington never lived there. In fact, died before it was open. So, since we're speaking, we're talking about this, and I talk about how myths, they can create myths of our founder to try to get us to think something about today. Let's get a couple quick myths since we're talking about this. Let's get to the Liberty Bell. The Liberty Bell. I don't want the Liberty Bell now. Let's come back to the Liberty Bell. Let's get to the Puritans. Here's another myth. One of the great myths is when we talk about uh, the United States, one of the things, and I was told this, that people came here for freedoms, for freedom. And one of the most important was the Puritans or the separatists came here for religious freedom. I'll come back to the Liberty Bell. I just didn't like the order that they arrived. Now, when I put down the Puritans, this is what I was told, even though everybody meant the pilgrims, the pilgrims. And so the pilgrims arrived in what is now Massachusetts and they came here for religious freedom. And the idea is that they were being persecuted back in England and they came here for all people to pursue the faith, the faith they want. And that fit in well with this concept of the United States of a, the growing idea of a separation of church and state and the idea that other religions can practice here with impunity, they can practice here with freedom, there's no religious test for, for office, and this fits both ways. For people who are more, the more liberal idea of pure religious freedom, they say, look, the pure, our founders, the Puritans came here for religious freedom. Religious freedom, that is our roots, and so we must allow all religions, or the more conservative ideal, that, I don't know why I'm going this way, I guess I'm trying to go left and right, but the more conservative idea that some religions are, uh, are more important and we cannot allow these religions to be taken away. You see this big argument that the Puritans came here for religious freedom and we must allow for freedom of religion and that would be a way to attack rulings against, for example, prayer in school or other religious activities in government saying you're, de you're depriving my religious freedom. Look at the Puritans. So let's be very clear about it. The Puritans come here for religious freedom? Absolutely not. The Puritans came to the United States for the freedom to be Puritans. That's it, period. Their belief in predestination, their belief that they were blessed by being predestined to go to heaven before they were ever born. They believed that that was being infringed and they wanted to come to the new world so they could be Puritans and nobody else. All these other beliefs will make their blessed, um, uh, uh, their, their blessed colony um, lose its faith, lose its purity. They believed in re religious freedom for themselves and nobody else. In fact, the great story about the pilgrims 
the separatists who thought the Puritans didn't go far enough, they went to the Netherlands where they did have religious freedom. Let me rephrase that, much more religious freedom than any place else in Europe. In the Netherlands, in the, in the teens of the 1600s, they went there and they were appalled that there were other religions and their children were adopting different st the styles of the Dutch and wearing wooden shoes. And so this idea of religious freedom is purely a myth to get people to think something today. Either you're depriving my religious freedom by denying me the right to, prayer, um, to have organized prayer in school, or this uh, idea that we should all have religious freedom. And that's a myth, and it can be taken both ways. Speaking of that, there's a great myth. What about the pilgrims? When they landed and created Plymouth Colony, they landed and jumped on a big rock called Plymouth Rock. And it's now split, but this is a big tourist trap. And here's a picture of these so-called pilgrims or separatists with the Mayflower in the background. And they left standing on this big rock. And it's a 1620 on it. It's a big tour show. There's a big uh, monument built around this. And uh, no. No one has any idea where that came from. Sorry. This rock was uncovered. Uh, during a storm at the end of the 19th century, and they made up this story about Plymouth Rock and this great myth that they landed there. So it's kind of a folk tale, kind of a myth, but what's the real reason? First off, to tie the current city to the old to the old monument, but the big thing is to tie to it, to give it kind of a, you know, we have a great tie that other people don't have, but also to be clear, this is just to make money and people will buy it. God, what a great rock. Has anyone seen it? So let's get back to this next myth. And this is the myth that goes for the entire United States. And it's called the pristine myth, but let's just stick with Massachusetts right now. So the pilgrims and the Puritans alive. So the pilgrims in Plymouth and the Puritans a decade later in Boston. And Massachusetts was this wild wilderness and through their courage and initiative and bravery, they conquered the wilderness. Oh, sure, there's some help from the local tribes, but they built this great colony. They built this all. Well, there were many tribes there. Most famously, the, the powerful Wapanoags. There were thousands of villages along here. Some were pretty established. This is a painting of it, but you can imagine there's not going to be a lot of paintings uh, because, well, frankly, they, they didn't... Not many were seen. And the, the remnants of what were seen by the Puritans and the pilgrims and then fu future settlers was pretty desolate. But they had trade routes all from Newfoundland all the way down to Florida. Uh, there are different forms of self-government. They have some had elements of writing, culture. Music. I mean, these were pretty advanced. A little bit different than Europeans. They had different ideas of land, different ideas of a number of things, but there were thousands and they were mostly agrarian. Yes, they did farm, complicated forms of agriculture. Do you get the point? And, oh, and there wasn't a wilderness of just trees and forests and wood. No, they were farming all around the trees. They were controlling it. They were uh, cultivating it. They would use fire and other sources to burn through the, um, to trees to keep down the growth. They would plant their crops around the trees as for a number of different reasons, but this clip kept diversity and uh, they got healthy, individ healthy individual cr um, crops. A lot harder to pick. I think you can imagine that. If you have one flat field with, enough, a field with um, no trees on it, it's easier to pick to harvest. But what happened to the Wapanoads? Fishermen. The first English settlers of Massachusetts were almost certainly fishermen because off of Newfoundland, that area there was the richest fishing in the world, at least to the European point of view, up until the 20th century. And so they would fish and then dry the fish on the shore and so they could take it back to Britain because it's a long voyage. And that's one of the things I liked about this picture. It shows the Wapanoags and... And they're fishing right there. Or they're using the fish to dry the fish. And almost, you know, they certainly they traded 
with the various tribes there. These were not colonists, so they did not stay. Um, they also were slave hunters, but that's another story. But they were there, and what happened? They spread disease. Disease. Disease from Europe destroyed all these tribes. All along, you see it rippling, and it's so weird in talking about at the time of a pandemic, and nothing compares to the, the kind of um, pandemic, at least for the Western Hemisphere, that hit with the arrival of Europeans. It was already happening in the Caribbean. It was happening in the southern part of the United States. But it really hit Massachusetts at about, you know, 1600 to 1610, when the first fishermen really started to hit there. Now, part of the reason why they came later than, let's say, down to Florida is in the Western Hemisphere, the weather is significantly colder which was really weird to the, to the English. They thought, it's got, the weather's got to be nicer. It's lower latitude. Yeah. But disease killed them all. In fact, Plymouth was built on an abandoned Wapanoag village. Why was it abandoned? Virtually everybody died. Everybody had died on this fishing village along the river. It had elements of cleared fields and partially cleared fields for agriculture. There was a village. There were... Uh, buildings that were falling down over the decade or so after humans left, there were mass graves or by you know things like that. When the pilgrims arrived, well the separatists arrived, they moved right into this abandoned village. They moved right in, and so they did not clear the field. They took advantage of the fact that everybody was dead, and that's where they lived. And there's another story, and here is the villagers, the Plymouth Colony, you notice how they're dressed, and here they are, and by the way, this is educational material, I thought that's kind of funny. Last couple things for today, and here is a local tribesman visiting them. You're not really sure what, hands are out, so it's kind of submission, we don't know. But there's a story, and I remember this as a little kid, Squanto. And Squanto, which is actually not his name, but that's what it had come down through the myth. Squanto was this tribesman who, who visited Plymouth Colony and either felt sorry for him or something like that, but he helped them. Well, here he is with a smoking a pipe, but he helped them grow corn. I, I remember being fascinated by this as a little kid that he taught them how not only to grow, put maize seeds down, but take small fish and bury the fish next to it, and that would fertilize the corn. And, and uh, I just remember being just totally good. Wow, that's the most amazing thing ever. And we learned this because we did a Thanksgiving play. And so someone got to be Squanto. And actually his name was Tesquanto. That was actually as close phonetically to his name, but that turned into Squanto. And so this idea that Squanto came and helped, and this myth that he was like in awe of the pilgrims that wanted to help this new form of government. And that also implies that those who resisted weren't as enlightened as Squanto. Those who resisted the expansion of the Europeans, those few, which actually there were many. Why? Well, Squanto has, the Squantum has an amazing story. The Squantum was actually captured on the coast the, near Pl present-day Plymouth, captured, imprisoned, and sold into slavery in 1605, brought back to England. There, while he was there, he, this is actually uh, kind of complex, but he convinced a few local Puritans who were thinking about leaving, he convinced them that I know a place that would be good for you to live. He just wanted to get back home. And they sent him back home, Patuxet, right here, back to Plymouth. He was recaptured and enslaved back in Spain. He was rescued from slavery and escaped back to England. And then, a couple different times, he tried to escape, get back. But the reason he was allowed back in 1619 is he convinced the pilgrims, the separatists, that he 
would help them survive. He had a place, but he just wanted to get back home. But when he got home, everybody was dead. And so in 1620, the fall of 1620, when the pilgrims are alive, like going into the winter, he's alone. Everybody's gone. Everybody is gone. And he threw his lot in. It's basically, I have no choice. If I want to survive, I got to jump in with him. And that's why it's such a fascinating story. It's not this guy who saw, wow, these people are the chosen ones. Last couple things. One more thing about the pilgrims. It's a myth that they're very dour and austere. The pilgrims and the Puritans they always had big buckles on and they all wore black with the white collars or brown, very dour colors. And so... When we did our little Thanksgiving parade when I was a little kid, and I'm sure a lot of you did, we all had the big black and the big buckles. No, that is another myth to imply these pious, orthodox people, hardworking people. No, they had all kinds of colors. Colored lace was like the style that people had. Brown was used somewhat just because it was a relatively cheap dye, but colors were what people wore. This too was the same with the big hat and buckles. No. Oh. The big buckles all over? No. And that leads us to the last thing I wanted to get to today, the first Thanksgiving. So the first Thanksgiving in 1621, and we were told, you are probably told as a little kid, that the pilgrims had this Thanksgiving, and they invited all the local tribal members in, and they shared their food with them with the idea being that we are all together in this we're all together in this glorious endeavor to create a great society. Therefore, we are all together to create the United States and this first Thanksgiving. And so here's a painting of it, and it's actually pretty amusing. I remember we did this when I was a little kid. We did a Thanksgiving play, and me, they could just sense that I was a natural thespian. So I was a person who got to sit by the fire and I remember I was supposed to be constructing something. And so I didn't, I think my only, I had a voice where I said, you know, like, uh, come join us with like five other people. But I, I stole the show. I mean, everybody was focused on me. But we had balls. And we're supposed to be like making like furniture. But it was like a rubber a kickball. And I had a hammer and I was hitting that. And I know, I know. How did I become a teacher when I had my natural skills for acting? But William Bradford, who was eh, kind of the leader of uh, the pilgrims, he wrote that in 1621, he wrote this a decade later, we had this great thanksgiving and implied that all people were there. But here's a couple things about it. This was not a new or different or radical thing. Just one second. This was a harvest festival. There's always been a harvest festival. You come on a harvest festival with a day to give thanks for something, and these were almost always political moves. And there were probably more of the tribal members, even though they were devastated by the disease, than actual pilgrims. This was not this glorious day that the pilgrims had. It was just a traditional harvest festival, but then it became a big deal after the Civil War because this became a Yankee holiday. All right. So, that is where I'm going to quit. I love these myths. I, I'm going to give you a few more. Are there any questions? So, I will post this, and we'll have a little quiz. I'll figure out something. By the way, most of you are doing the test. You're doing quite well. Um, I hope the test wasn't... I thought it was really pretty small. Well, if there's no questions... All right. That is where I'm going to quit. Good. Um... Oh, I'm wrong, wrong place. If there are no questions, I am done. Goodbye.